Good morning, everyone. Uh, can everybody hear me? Mike, good. Everybody in the back? Uh, welcome. I'd like to welcome you guys all to SharePoint Conference and uh, to this morning's um, uh, set of talks. We have two more days uh, going on. I hope everybody enjoyed the last night's concert in Bon Jovi. Um, I'm actually quite excited to see this many people today. At first, I had a great slot on Tuesday. It was like right in the afternoon, right after lunch. Uh, and so I expected you know, uh, have a great crowd. And then they told me that I'm following Bon Jovi's act. And so it's a little tougher, and I wasn't quite sure what to expect. But I'm glad that we have such a great turnout, because I think we have uh, some very interesting information to talk about today. Uh, my name is Andrew, and I'm one of the few Microsoft people here that doesn't work on Exchange or doesn't work with Exchange. Oh, sorry, SharePoint. I work on Exchange, and I'm going to tell you all about uh, apps for Outlook or mail apps. And I think the best way to introduce apps for Outlook or mail apps is to actually just start off with a, with a, uh, a demo, a quick uh, look at what they really are all about. And so up here, I've brought up a screen of the brand new Outlook. It's uh, Outlook, um, Outlook Web App, actually, Outlook Web App 2013. And what we're looking at is a mail from one of my good friends, Paul, who's asking me to meet up with him. And so he's giving me the address of his office. And actually, uh, it looks like I'm not such a great friend because he asked to meet up with me over a month ago, and I never replied. Um, but that aside, he gives me a, uh, an address of his office, and so I could go and look it up uh, where, where, uh, where it's located to go find him. Now, I think you guys know how this goes. Uh, the general story is, you know, wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it be great if instead of having to grab this address to, and copy and paste it into a brand new window to find, to find his uh, office, to find his, uh, where on the map it is, wouldn't it be great if I could just, with a click of a button, see exactly where it is, get the directions to his office, view it on a larger map, scroll it around. Well, let's take a look at another scenario. In this case, Paul has sent me a, a mail, another mail, and here he's asking me to sign something. Specifically, he sent me some contract, and he's asking me to sign this contract. Wouldn't it be awesome if instead of having to print the thing out, go sign it, scan it back, with one click of a button, I could just grab the signature, drop it in, and hit finish signing. And then we'd be done. And we can mail back the, the document right back to Paul and be done with, the, uh, with this job. This is what mail apps are all about. They're about bringing contextual actions to the mail that you're looking at. They're about uh, bringing in new scenarios and connecting the software that you use to really get tasks done. And in terms of mail apps, there are three main things you need to know. The first thing is that mail apps are just another type of an app, uh, such uh, like task pane app or a content app. For those of you who uh, attended uh, yesterday's talk on apps for Office, you learned about task pane and content apps. And a mail app is simply a third type of an app. Now, mail apps only appear within messages and appointments, and only in the read case. So you we don't support, in version 1, mail apps in the Compose scenario. Uh, and also, mail apps are only supported in the Outlook client today. The second point is that mail apps are meant to be contextual to the current message. Uh, specifically, mail apps are designed to only appear on messages where they can provide uh, contextual or relevant information or action. And developers achieve this by editing or creating uh, activation rules. And we'll talk about those in a, min in a minute. And the final point is that mail apps are meant to be cross-platform and cross-device. And what this means is that the same exact app, th that same Bing Maps app that we just saw, will work in Outlook Rich Client, will work in Outlook Web App, and it'll also work in Outlook Web App running on your iPad or iPhone. We actually have a uh, dedicated view uh, on mobile and tablet devices for Outlook Web App. So that same exact app, once the user deploys it uh, into, into his mailbox, um, it'll just run everywhere in every Outlook instance that he uses. Let's dig in a little deeper. So how do mail apps actually work? Well, when the admin or the end user add or deploy the app, 
uh, what really happens is that the manifest, and uh, mail apps, just like task pane and content, apps consist of a manifest and HTML and JavaScript uh, portion. So the manifest is deployed into Exchange. Uh, specifically, it's saved to the user's uh, mailbox. This does imply that Exchange 2013 is required for mail apps. So if you have Outlook, uh, 20, uh, if you have Outlook 2013, but it's not connected to Exchange, then you can't get mail apps. Likewise, if you have an older version of Outlook connected to Exchange 2013, then you won't be able to get mail apps in the older version of Outlook, but Outlook web app will still have them. Now, when the user opens the Outlook client, the first thing that happens is that Outlook loads in all of the manifests, all of the app manifests into memory. And then when the user selects a message, Outlook goes through every single manifest, through every app, and it looks at all the rules within that ma manifest. Any rule that matches uh, properties on the current item, uh, that app will be added to the app bar. And that's where we saw the Bing, uh, Bing Maps app. So we saw that it was within that gray app bar. However, at this point, the app is not actually running. It's simply appearing there. It's telling the user that, hey, there is some contextual information. Click on me, and I can show you more, uh, more actions. It's up to the user to then click on the app in order to actually activate it or, and start running it. And once he clicks on the tab, uh, again, the same thing as with task pane apps and content apps uh, happens. Um, the, the first thing is that we load the HTML and JavaScript of the app uh, into the frame. The apps must reference office.js API, and that API will initialize. Uh, and then the app can continue running its business logic and use office.js in order to interact with the Outlook client. So let's talk about how you can actually build an app. And specifically, how do you, make, how do you specify when an app should appear, when, when a mail app should, should load? Uh, so the, we'll talk about rules in a moment. But the first thing that I want to mention, and this will become uh, important in just a second, are extracted entities. And extracted entities are a new concept within Exchange 2013. Whenever a message comes in to Exchange, the first thing that happens is that Exchange actually parses through the subject and the body of the message to look for interesting or important text. And specifically, it looks for text such as US postal addresses, any SMTP address, URLs, meeting or task suggestions, and a few others. And if any of those are found, Exchange uh, actually stamps an item uh, or property on that item with the value of this entity. So entities are really just another pro uh, property on the item, except that they've been extracted out of the message or, uh, or, um, or meeting re request. And we'll see why these are relevant in a moment. But let's take a look at how we can, we can build uh, uh, these activation rules and how we can specify um, when apps should appear. So the most basic activation rule that we have is the item is rule. This rule is, uh, appears, um, this rule is defined in the manifest. And it allows developers to specify when, uh, uh, whether an app should appear on specific uh, items. So the item type could be a message, an appointment, uh, or you could even specify a custom item class. Now, for those of you who are familiar with Exchange programming, you'll know that you can, uh, a developer can create messages with their own item classes. Uh, for example, if you have an automated mailer, uh, if you have some mailing system, and that mailing system sends out alerts about the health of, the, uh, of, the, of your network or health of your data center, uh, you can create those alerts, those alert messages. You can actually create a special item class for them. And then if you're building a mail app, you can then have your mail app activate only on those messages and allow the user to take an action, such as dismiss the alert or maybe take some action on it. So this item is rule. Uh, this is the most basic rule. It allows you to specify to activate messages or appointments. Um, but what if we want to make a little more complicated rule? Well, then we can use a rule collection. Rule collection is simply a way to group multiple rules together. You can use the operator or, or you can use the operator and. And you can nest multiple rules within each other. We also have an item has attachment rule. So if you ever want to have your uh, app only appear on messages with attachments, then you can use this rule. 
possibly one of the most powerful rules and most useful rules is the item has regular expression match. And this allows developers to specify a regular expression to match against either the subject, the body, or the sender's uh, email address. If there is a match, then the app will be loaded. Uh, if there is no match, then uh, the app won't appear. And finally, we have the item has known entity uh, rule. And this rule allows uh, apps to appear only on messages or appointments that have a specific uh, entity extracted on it and stamped on it. And so this is exactly how the Bing Maps app actually works. The Bing Maps app uh, only appears on messages and appointments that have an address entity on them. And this is the, the activation rule for it. So let's take a look at what this actually looks like in code so that we get a little better understanding of things. So I'm going to switch to a project that I already pre-created. Uh, again, for those of you who attended previous talks, I think they, they showed how to create new office, uh, uh, new office apps or apps for office projects within Visual Studio. And uh, this is when you select the mail app. So first you select the office, uh, office app. But when, once you've selected the mail app um, uh, project, this is, this is the first thing that you'll see. So what we're looking at right now is the manifest to the app. I'm not going to go through every single element, but the main takeaway here is that the manifest is pretty much identical to what you've seen with task pane apps and content apps. There are just a number of small uh, differences, one of them being the requested height. So uh, for, for mail apps, as you remember, they're horizontally uh, oriented, so they expand downwards. And the developer has to specify the height that he needs. Uh, we also have a number of settings. So here we've defined desktop settings, but if you'd like to define your app to also appear within a, a tablet device or a mobile device, then you have to add mobile settings and uh, tablet settings. So it's your choice. You don't have to have the app appear everywhere, but we do recommend it. But here's the section where we edit the rules. And so uh, this is probably um, the most important uh, uh, section when you're building the manifest, because everything else will be pre-populated for you. Uh, so in this case, this is, the, uh, this is a, a rule collection that I created. Uh, I want to show you a item has uh, known entity rule uh, to demonstrate one aspect that I haven't mentioned so far. So the way we create this is we specify a rule. And then Visual Studio will help us out with the autocomplete. So I know that I want item has known entity. And this could be it. Or sorry, and I have to specify the entity type. I'll specify URL for now. Now this could be it. This could be the full rule. And this means that your app will appear in every message that has a URL. But let's say that you want to fine tune that app. Let's say that you only want your app to appear on messages that have a very specific URL in it. Well, then you can specify a filter. And so we'll give the filter a name. We can call it um, filter. And then right here, we can specify a regular expression. And this would be our regex, for example, contoso.com. And now this rule says activate on any item that has the URL with contoso.com within it. So this is how you can narrow down uh, exactly which URLs your app is, uh, appears for. Um, we can also make a more complex rule. So I'll uh, extract this out for a moment. And instead, we'll start with rule, and we'll create a rule collection. And I'll give it an operator. Let's say we say and. And then in here, maybe we want to activate on specifically uh, messages. So I'll, I'll type item is. Uh, now here, if I, if I typed item class, this is where you would specify the custom item class. But instead, I'll, we'll, we'll specify a message. We'll add in the original rule, the item has known entity rule. And we've made a rule collection. As I mentioned, you can nest multiple rule collections within each other. And feel free to do so. Uh, there are only a subset of scenarios that really require complex rules. Um, and they're generally around uh, regular expressions. Um, but, but you can do this. Uh, the only thing to keep in mind is that you are limited to 15 total rules. So you can't, go, uh, you can't really go uh, beyond that. So just uh, please be mindful of that. So let's take a look at the mail APIs. 
Um, now, for those of you who've seen the, uh, the presentation yesterday, the task pane and the content app presentation yesterday, uh, you would have seen that the mail APIs, uh, or rather uh, the task pane APIs uh, and content apps, they, use, they utilize the document APIs uh, in the Office uh, JavaScript branch. With mail apps, uh, mail apps in version one only implement the mailbox branch of office.js. So although we do support the same uh, set of APIs, the same gen uh, general framework, in version one, mail apps only support the mailbox version. And mailbox gives, uh, gives uh, access to uh, item properties, uh, user profile, exchange web services, and a number of other um, uh, properties and, and method calls. Specifically, uh, we can kind of break down this, the structure and go one by one as to what capabilities uh, are available uh, to mail apps. So the most basic, the most basic uh, set of APIs are around access to item properties. So an app can access uh, recipients on the current message. An app can take a look at the subject or, date, or the date sent of the message. If this was an appointment and not a message, and this is why we have the breakdown at the bottom, uh, right, at the bottom of the diagram, so if, this is, if the item instead was an appointment, uh, then, you could, then the app can get access to the start or the end time uh, and other appointment properties. Uh, the app can also access the extracted entities on the item. Again, remember that extracted entities are just a property, so regardless of whether or not you're specified to activate, uh, on extracted entities, you can always access them if they're available. And finally, if an app specifies uh, a regular expression to match, uh, then you can access regular expression matches. So let's take a look at what that looks like in code, and I'll show a few, uh, a few samples. So we're looking back at the manifest, and now I'll open the JavaScript file that was also created by my project. And here at the top, we can, we can see um, the very first line, and this is actually a template that Visual Studio creates for us. Uh, and, and not all of this code is pre-populated initially. So the very first line, we create a reference to the item object. And the way we access it is we call office.context.mailbox.item. From here, this is where we can access different item properties. So we can type item.cc, for example. And that's how we access the cc field. And this would be a collection of uh, of email ad uh, address details, it's basically a collection of addresses. Likewise, we can access the two property. To access um, the, uh, the extracted entities, uh, the pattern is a little different. So we would have to do item dot um, get entities by type, for example, and then in here we can specify uh, an entity type such as addresses. So this would give us all the addresses extracted from the message uh, or, or meeting request. And when the meeting request is converted into an appointment, that still remains. If we specified a regular expression, then we would call uh, get regex matches. Now this method would return us all regular expression matches. So if we had a number of different regular expression rules, uh, then this would return every single match for every rule. But if you only want to specify to get the matches for a specific rule that you created, well, you have to give a regular expression rule a name. So then in this case, we would actually use the get regex matches by name method. And we would uh, put in the name of the regular expression. Uh, here, it's whatever name you gave it in the manifest. And this is how we would access them. Uh, continuing on, the next level of uh, API access, yeah. I'm sorry? When is document that ready called? So the first thing that happens is office.initialize is called. And that, that has to be uh, the number one thing in your app. So the question is, when is the document that ready uh, invoked? So when you're building an app, the first thing that happens is the first line in your app should be office.js loading the script. 
This is actually extremely important for two reasons. Uh, one, because it, it uh, creates all the necessary infrastructure for you to be able to utilize the APIs to begin with. But second of all, if you don't, act, if you don't call it within five, within five seconds of your HTML loading, we'll actually kill the app. We'll assume that the HTML, the, the URL link, the, the source location is dead, and we'll kill the app with a graceful error message. So uh, when you're designing your infrastructure, you have to specify that to be the first line. Once that's done, that's when uh, it'll in invoke. Oh, it's when the user clicks on the tab. So do you remember how, here, I can switch back. So it specifically happens here. So when the user clicks on Bing Maps, that's when it happens. OK? So right now, nothing is running. I click on it. Now it, now, uh, it just executed. OK? Cool. Um, so continuing on, the next, uh, the next level of API access that we do provide is an API to interact with Outlook Forms. Now, as a developer, you can, you can invoke uh, a method to, uh, create a new, uh, to create a new appointment, for example, and you can pre-populate it with certain fields. And what this allows you to do is, uh, is create a button that allows a user to, when the user clicks on this button, it pops up the actual Outlook new appointment form. And you can actually pre-populate it with the subject, the body, maybe a few other fields, such as the recipient. Um, you can also display existing messages, uh, or you can display a reply, for, a reply form, also pre-populated with a template or some sort of a response uh, to the original message. We provide ac limited access uh, to Exchange Web Services. And just out of curiosity, how many people in this room are familiar with Exchange Web Services? Okay, so about, about a third or a quarter or so. For those of you who are not familiar with Exchange Web Services, it is a SOAP-based protocol, SOAP XML-based protocol, uh, to really get very deep um, uh, integration, to achieve deep integration with Exchange. It allows you to access any item within the user's mailbox. It allows you to access any property on any item. And it allows you to execute uh, certain business logic around calendaring, messaging, sending messages, uh, and a number of other things. Uh, just as an example, Outlook for Mac is implemented entirely on Exchange Web Services. So you can actually build a full-fledged Outlook client on this API. Because this API is so powerful, uh, we do limit which methods can be uh, invoked by the app. But at the same time, they are also uh, quite a large uh, uh, number of them. So we allow, any, uh, we allow uh, search methods, search capabilities. So for example, you can invoke find items to look up items in the mailbox. You can create uh, objects. You can create appointments. You can create messages, tasks, contacts in the mailbox. And you can even send out messages or meeting invites. What the app cannot do is delete items, for example. Uh, it can't, or it can't invoke uh, operations on the entire organization. So you can't check the gal. You can't iterate through every single person in the organization. This is really limited to the user's mailbox. Um, now, although we do provide you this uh, this capability, uh, as we'll see later, if the app does need access to Exchange Web Services, only administrators will be able to install those apps, and users will not. So you have the trade-off. We can you can uh, invoke extra power with Exchange Web Services, but then it's only administrators that will be able to uh, to install those apps, to add those apps uh, to user mailboxes. And I'd like to switch quickly back to, um, to our little project. And here, uh, I'll show another quick demo of uh, how, you can, uh, how you can invoke some of those methods. Um, so I'll create a variable. And I'll call this mailbox now. And we'll, this time, we'll create a quick uh, uh, reference to the uh, mailbox. So mailbox. And from here, this is where we can invoke uh, some of the interesting methods. So for example, we can invoke mailbox dot uh, display new appointment form. And here, using the IntelliSense, I know it's, uh, it looks pretty small. Actually, maybe I can increase the screen size. Oh, it still doesn't uh, improve the, uh, the IntelliSense. But you can see uh, some of the fields that you can pre-populate in. So it's really a large number. So for example, you can specify the required attendees. You can specify the start and end time. 
the location, the subject, the body. Uh, you can even add a uh, few uh, custom properties that will be transmitted uh, with, the, with this appointment. Um, alternatively, if you want to invoke Exchange Web Services, then you have to make a make AWS request call. And as you can see, this is the first async method that we've encountered. Uh, this is an asynchronous method because you'll need to get a response back from the server. So the first uh, parameter here is the string data. It really just accepts in a string version of the XML SOAP request. Uh, and we have uh, lots of uh, uh, detailed uh, documentation on these SOAP requests uh, up on our MSDN site. So if, you're, if you'd like to learn more about making uh, Exchange Web Services calls, um, you can reference that. But the second parameter will be the callback. And then the, uh, the pattern is exactly the same as we've seen in, in other uh, Office.js cases for asynchronous programming. So in the async callback method, then you can access the, the response and you can parse it out. You will have to parse the method manually, though. Uh, so, uh, or I mean, you can if you have a JavaScript uh, XML um, reader, you know, if you load it into an object, then you can parse it through there. But otherwise, you get back just a string uh, raw XML uh, response. And the last, the last interesting method off of the mailbox object is this token for single sign-on. So, with Exchange, the user is logged in, and Exchange knows who the user is. Now, most apps that are going to be loaded within Outlook, in order to really do something interesting, like the DocuSign app, in order to allow me to sign the document, the DocuSign app needs to be able to identify who I am. It needs to be able to authenticate me to themselves. Now, you can use a variety of methods to authenticate. You can use the most rudimentary way, where you just ask the user to log in. You give him a login form, and then you store a cookie on his machine. But then that doesn't really roam when the user switches devices from, from Outlook rich client to the tablet to the phone. Uh, and it can also be a little cumbersome for the user, especially on the phone when I click log in, it launches a brand new uh, window, I log in there, I have to close it. It just feels clunky. So instead, you can utilize a identity token that we provide uh, from Exchange, and we'll go over the flow in a moment uh, on how this works. Um, but you can utilize this, uh, this exchange identity token in order to identify the user. And this identity token includes a unique identifier that will stay with this user. So once the user uh, logs in for the first time, he'll never have to log in across any other Outlook client. This token is unique to mail apps. So, uh, we're, uh, so apps for Word or apps for Excel, they don't have this. Uh, but within mail apps, you can utilize this. And within our structure, right next to the mailbox, uh, we can see, um, r right off of the mailbox, actually, we can see the user profile information. Again, this API is also unique to mail apps. Uh, you, you don't have access to user profile information within, um, within task pane or content apps. And it provides exactly what you would expect, some basic user uh, profile information, the name, the email address, the time zone. Uh, actually, off of office.context, you can also get access to the culture. So if you want to localize your app and make sure that it's uh, displayed correctly and everything is uh, coming up correctly, then you can use uh, the display language property. The final point about, uh, about apps or about uh, mail app APIs is data storage. There are two types of data storage for mail uh, APIs. We have a per app property bag and a per app per item property bag. The per app property bag, both of them are dictionaries of key value pairs. The per app property bag is saved within the mailbox, which means that regardless of what item your user opens your app on, because remember, apps are opened on an individual item. They're not opened on Outlook itself. So regardless of what, app you, uh, what item you, uh, the user opens the app on, uh, that property bag will always be accessible. It's really, we call it roaming settings. It, it's a bunch of settings, they roam together. The other property bag is the per item uh, per app one. This, this property bag is saved on the specific item. So this is meant for, uh, to allow apps to save their own prop, uh, properties, their own flags on this item, so that any time a user opens the app on that specific item again, he'll have access to, uh, to those properties. And we have two different ways to access them. Um, the roaming settings, it's very easy. You just, uh, you just call it. It's a synchronous method, and you get access to this object. Uh, the the, uh, the uh, um, per app per item property bag is called 
custom properties, and that you have to load asynchronously off of the item. But once you've loaded them, once you've gained access to the actual object, the rest of, the, uh, the rest of access is very similar. So we can see here uh, custom props.get. If we're uh, working with the roaming settings, we'd call settings.get, settings.set, and then save async. So th that functionality would be the same. Before we talk about authentication, are there any questions on, uh, on APIs uh, or the manifest so far? No. OK, great. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about authentication. So as I mentioned, in order to build very interesting mail apps, you have to be able to authenticate the user. And you can use standard web approaches, but if you want to achieve single sign-on across Outlook clients, then you have to use uh, this exchange identity token. And the basic flow for it is this. So the first thing you have to do is you have to uh, access an exchange identity token. It's an asynchronous method hanging off of the mailbox object, and it's very, fairly simple. You can call mailbox that get user identity token. It's uh, self-explanatory. Now, once you've gotten this token, you pass it back along with the request to your uh, backend service. This is the cloud that we see in the diagram. So now the backend service has the token. The first thing it needs to do, the token is plain text, uh, but it is signed. So the backend service has to go ahead and validate the signature. Um, once the signature has been validated, it can look into uh, inside the token and it can grab the unique identifier from out of the token. Now, it takes the unique identifier and has to maintain a mapping between unique identifiers and known user identities. So, uh, we're assuming that the, this cloud uses its own identity provider, its own uh, custom IDP, so it needs to maintain a mapping of exchange identities to its own well-known identities. And this is done via this mapping. If the mapping doesn't exist, if this is the very first time that the user uh, uses this app, then the, app, then the service has to respond back to the app, prompting the user for his credentials. Once the user uh, provides his credentials, now you, can now you can create the association, because now you can uh, uh, log in the user, authenticate the user. And once you've uh, authenticated your user, now you have the, the token with the unique identifier, and you have the user identity, uh, so you can create the mapping. On subsequent times, next time the user uh, opens this app, be it in Outlook web app, Outlook web app on an iPhone or on a tablet, you'll get the same unique identifier. Obviously, some of the claims within the token will change, like uh, the, uh, when it's valid in the period of its validity. Um, but the unique identifier will stay there. So once you've validated it, it'll just, uh, it'll just continue to work, and you can always keep the user logged in. This is how you build single sign-on within uh, Outlook apps. Um, doing this is actually extremely complex. Uh, building it by hand, implementing manually the, the validation flow. And not just the validation flow, but the actual authorization flow uh, is, is quite complicated. And there are some uh, pretty key uh, and deep um, concepts that you have to grasp. We have great documentation on this that explains those. But we also built the .NET managed library, which just takes away all of the burden for you. So so long as you guys are building on .NET, which I, I, I'm guessing everybody, most of the people in this room are doing anyway, uh, you can just grab our .NET uh, managed library, and there it literally is as simple as you create an object, put the token into it, and then it just tells you whether you call an is valid method, and if it's valid, you grab the unique identifier from it and put it into your mapping, put it into your database, into your dictionary, to wherever. Um, otherwise, it's, it's a lot more complicated. Um, any questions on, on authentication? The last point about um, data access and API access is, uh, is around permissions. So mail apps have to specify what permission level they're going to use. Uh, they have to declare explicitly uh, in the, within the manifest what, per, what level of uh, API access they will need. And we have three uh, levels within, uh, within mail apps. We have restricted, read item, and read write mailbox. If you specify restricted, uh, then the app can only access data from limited set of uh, entities. You can't use rules such as regular expressions. Uh, you can't, um, you can't uh, access most of the JavaScript uh, item properties. But when the user adds this app, 
He's also not even prompted with anything. He's not told that the app might be able to access some of your sensitive email data and could send it back to a third party service. The user clicks add, the app is just added. Uh, if you do need more uh, deeper access, which most apps will, and most apps do require more, uh, more complex access, then you can utilize the read item permission. In this case, um, apps can access uh, all of the uh, apps can use all of the uh, rules that we've discussed, all of the activation rules. Regular expressions are allowed, and all JavaScript APIs are allowed. The only part that's not allowed is EWS. And finally, if you need to use EWS access, then you have to declare the read-write mailbox uh, permission level. And as I mentioned previously, only administrators can add those apps. So uh, these are. It is a pretty powerful uh, uh, set of APIs, and, and we're only limited to admins for V1. So we've been working with this app for a little bit. Let's actually deploy this and see what this looks like. So as I mentioned, this is, this is the most basic template that your app, uh, that Visual Studio creates for you, and it pre-populates um, uh, with, with, the following, with these uh, properties. This, this is the actual JavaScript that's just auto-generated for you. Um, if we take a quick look at the HTML that's also pre-generated, we'll see that this app will create a quick div, and we'll just list out the different properties that are on this app. So the subject, uh, who it's from, who it's sent to. And this is done by, uh, we're just using um, uh, just very, very simple uh, item.normalize subject. Uh, item.from, item.2. This is how we access uh, some of the properties here. Again, if you notice, this is all synchronous action. We really wanted to make it very simple to access some of the most basic properties. So the interesting thing is what happens when I hit start? And this is new. The, you, you don't see this with task pane and content apps. But if you think about it, it also makes sense. As I mentioned in the beginning of the talk, apps are installed to a specific mailbox. So you have to specify the credentials to that mailbox in order to be able to deploy the app. So I have a test account, and I'm going to uh, uh, specify the email address here, and also the password to it. Now if I hit re remember my email, uh, Visual Studio won't ask me anymore for this credential information, and it'll actually remember it. And I'll hit connect. And so it's going to think for a little bit, it's trying to uh, retrieve all of my settings. So it's trying to retrieve uh, the, the URL where Exchange Web Services is hosted so that it can install. Um, once, it's doing it, once it's done that, it's deploying the app into Exchange right now. And finally, it launches uh, IE. You can configure it to launch Outlook instead, but I have it by default uh, uh, launch uh, Internet Explorer, and it takes me to, uh, to Outlook Web App. Here I'm prompted again, and this is actually Outlook Web App prompting me to log in, so uh, Visual Studio can't uh, quite log me in right there. But once I'm, I log into Outlook Web App, which will take a moment or two, depending on the quality of our network, we can see, uh, we can see um, number of apps. And uh, one second. It looks like uh, one of the uh, calls to uh, install the app is failing, but we would see the mail app uh, listed on our right-hand side um, uh, of, of the app. Uh, coming back, we've talked about, we've talked about um, the APIs that, that you can access, and we talked about some of the different apps, and I showed you a demo of how you can build uh, your own mail app and access some of the properties on it, but but that's not really why we're we're here, uh, and and those aren't the, and and the, especially the the app that shows you details on uh, on the current message, like who sent the message to you, 
isn't, isn't really the compelling scenario that we're after. You know, when we, when we talk to our customers, what we really hear is that over 80% of information workers spend their entire day within Outlook. And they view Outlook not just as a source of communication, but it's really their starting point to getting tasks done. It's really their, the, the, the way that they run their entire day. But Outlook itself is not enough. Outlook itself is not, is, is not enough to complete the tasks, to get the job done. And what's extremely important are all the other software that these, uh, these information workers have to use, that these users use uh, every day in order, to, in order to, to just do their work. And oftentimes, switching to this uh, uh, other piece of software can be just quite painful or complicated. Other times, it can just be impossible like if the user is on their phone, mobile phone or tablet. The goal of these apps, the goal of mail apps, and the goal of uh, apps for Outlook is to be able to pull in all of these third-party solutions back into Outlook, back into context where the user is in, so that he can really complete all of these tasks without having to either incur this pain or, again, perhaps it's just not possible. If I'm at the airport and I'm using my uh, mobile phone and I just received an alert that the health of my system is down, that something's happening, I need to be able to take action on it. And rather than hitting the forward this thing to the next guy and ask him, hey, can you look at this? With an app, you could simply press a button and see what the alert is about. And perhaps it's just a a false alert and you can just uh, uh, resolve it and take it away without having to miss your flight. This is, these are the kinds of compelling scenarios that are really going to help our users. And so if you, if you just think about it, we can, we can break it down into kind of three different classes of type or ta types of apps. You can imagine apps that activate on sp uh, specific patterns. For example, you can imagine a, a, a bug tracking app or you can imagine a package tracking app. And internally within Microsoft, we use uh, a, a bug tracking software. It's called Product Studio. We've actually built this. This is a screenshot of one of our apps. Uh, anytime somebody emails me and says, hey, what do you think about this bug number? The app is activated there. I click, on the, I click on the app, and without having to launch this bug tracking software, I can just interact with the bug immediately. I can specify whether, uh, yes, it's mine, or here's, here's what's going on, here's the issue. Or I can just close it out and say that, hey, it's done. We've already fixed this issue. You can imagine uh, similar cases for package tracking. If I receive a package from FedEx or UPS, uh, or if I receive a notification that I have a package coming, I can keep an eye and I can uh, tell when this package is going to arrive. Or in legal cases, uh, if there is a case number that I need to look up, if somebody is asking me, hey, what do you think about this, uh, this case? Uh, how do I respond to the customer? Uh, this is a very quick way to find it without having to manually uh, dig through and copy and paste and switch context. We can imagine another class of entities or another class of apps which activate on en entities or special item classes. You can imagine an app that activates on news links. So th these would be URLs within the message and it provides a news link summary. Or you could imagine an app that activates whenever there's a, a phone number present and it allows the user to quickly dial that phone number and perhaps even set up a meeting with a person. We've, we're also, uh, we've also built uh, workflow apps internally that are really around custom exchange item classes. So anytime somebody assigns a, a task for you within SharePoint, if SharePoint sends out an email, a, mailer, uh, a mail alert to the user and says, hey, you have this task assigned to you, you can build a mail app that activates specifically only on those messages. And on those messages, a user can click and, uh, and say, hey, uh, yeah, I get it. I have a task. Here's the current status, or let me update it. You can also imagine uh, apps that we, might, that we have uh, in the store. You know, here, my, my buddy Paul sends, out, uh, sends me an email and tells me, check out this YouTube link. If I click on it, I can see right there, I can see the entire uh, YouTube uh, uh, app. And I can play the video right there within my mail. I don't, have to, I don't have to navigate away. I don't have to copy anything. If I'm on my tablet, it's just two taps. I don't need to create a new window. We can also imagine apps that activate on all items. And I do encourage you to think about really contextual activation and really fine tuning when the app appears. Because whenever an app appears 
and it's not useful to the users, the users never click on it. And in fact, it's, it's, it's a dramatically negative experience because when the app appears too often, users just forget about it. And even when it is useful, then they don't click on it either. So it really has to be fine-tuned. But there are some cases when an app is always relevant. There's a case in CRM where you, a user needs to track messages in CRM. And some customers need to track virtually every message in CRM. And in that case, it's perfectly reasonable and it makes complete sense to have the app appear on every single message. I think you guys have seen the LinkedIn app already here. I have a quick screenshot of it. But you never know when I might need to look up more information about somebody who I'm having a meeting with or somebody who is on the same uh, conversation thread as I am. And so LinkedIn would be uh, quite important. Um, and you can also imagine uh, displaying information about recipients. So if you're building an accounting solution, uh, or if you're building a SharePoint My Site app and you want to show the user, hey, here's the org structure of how you are related to the people that are on this thread because you're in a company of 400,000 people, the app can help you do that. The app can achieve that for the user. Or you can consider a completely different scenario, again, around uh, appearing on every message. In this case, we have a Take Note app. Uh, and this one is also in our office store today. It's built by Messageware. Uh, and this allows me to take notes on either the sender or I can take notes on the, on the specific email message. And here uh, you know, I, I, I can see that, oh, well, a month ago, Paul was looking for a 70s Volkswagen. That's probably why he wanted to meet up with me. Um, although I don't have one, maybe he was hoping that I do. Uh, but I can take notes on, on any message or uh, on any sender. This would be another example of an app that's, that's uh, always relevant. So I do encourage you, when you think about apps for Outlook, when you think about mail apps, really think about what are the most compelling scenarios? What are, where are your users seeing the most pain today? What software do they use to solve it? And how can you bridge that gap? How can you bring in that software within the, the Outlook item itself? The last part uh, that we'll talk about um, will be uh, kind of best practices and uh, development considerations. And there are a number of talks around 10 key ideas of how to, uh, of how to build apps. Uh, there are some other talks on, on authentication or, some, or usability. Uh, but I'll just focus on uh, just a few of them. So the first part is I do uh, encourage you to request appropriate permissions. So apps, remember that apps that request rewrite mailbox can only, uh, permissions can only be installed by administrators. Um, end users can only install apps that, uh, that are uh, below that. Uh, please be mindful of performance. The same, the same, the same uh, app, the same regular expression that activates on a desktop client uh, or within, uh, within a browser does not necessarily work on a tablet or a mobile uh, device. Um, this is because tablets and mobile devices have different, uh, have different hardware, they have different hardware acceleration, they even have different software written for them. Safari is not optimized to perform certain tasks. So if you do want your app to run in uh, all the devices, and we highly encourage you to build that uh, to really help our users, please make sure that you, uh, when, you, when you do the testing of your app, please make sure that you test across all devices and across all the supported browsers. Um, and this also goes for using APIs as well, you know, for making, uh, for making calls uh, uh, both for, for using the, the JavaScript API and also for making calls back to your own service. Um, and the final point is around the UX styles. So when you build the app, remember that it is horizontal. The app itself actually stretches uh, horizontally to fit the, the entire window. So the frame is dynamically stretched based on the size of the window itself, of Outlook. Please make sure that you build the app so that it automatically adjusts with the window. It's not, it, please don't center it uh, in the middle, um, because then it will look strange. It will look awkward to the end user. If the end user sees that the message begins on the left-hand side, but the app is centered this way, it's just not going to align. So you should always align to the left, and you should stretch out. You, should, you can use, for example, table layout within HTML in order to stretch the app out and, and use up uh, all of the available space. Please don't request more vertical space than you will use. You cannot dynamically adjust the vertical space. So once you've set it in the manifest, 
that is what you get. Um, please don't ask for more because then it's just white space and again it looks ugly to the user and it takes up um, very expensive screen real estate, uh, especially on the smaller screens. If it, we are seeing a trend that uh, in general devices are going to be wider screened and in smaller in terms of height. So anytime an app uses more vertical space than it needs, really the body just gets pushed down and out of the view and then all of a sudden the user's kind of losing the context as to why that app appeared in the first place. And the final point about UX uh, styles is that please don't use uh, scroll bars. Um, please use paging instead. Uh, scroll bars make a very uh, weird experience and in some cases um, we might have an automatic uh, uh, Outlook web app or Outlook scroll bar already there and so you'll just have a double scroll bar and this will just look very um, very awkward to the user and it's, it's, it's just not the experience that we want to deliver. Uh, I think using paging is a much better technique. It's a much, much softer technique. Um, it's much easier to present information this way. So, I think this is, we've covered pretty much everything about uh, apps for Outlook. Before I open up the floor for questions, I did want to mention a couple of additional resources that we have available. So first of all, uh, you can see, uh, you can learn more about office development on dev.office.com. Um, you can, there is plenty of related content uh, to, going on throughout these sessions at SharePoint Conference. A uh, number of these talks have already happened, some of the introduction talks, however, all of this information will be available online, so I do encourage you to take a look at it to learn more about Apps for Office platform. One of the talks actually hasn't happened yet, and it's going to be uh, on Thursday tomorrow at 12 o'clock. And so uh, if you're interested about uh, enlisting your apps uh, for sale uh, in the marketplace, um, uh, or with Apps for Outlook, uh, we don't support commerce in V1, so you would have to list it for free. But if you are interested in listing your apps uh, in the store, then you, uh, you should attend this uh, talk and you'll learn more about that. And throughout today and tomorrow, we do have one-on-one -on -one sessions available. So if you are interested in talking more about a specific scenario or finding out how to, how to implement this, a certain app, uh, that, is, that is possible and you can, uh, we can arrange that for you and we, you can meet with the experts and we can actually sketch out and whiteboard out your uh, apps. Uh, but otherwise, are there any questions? You, you guys are welcome to uh, come up to the microphones and yeah. Yeah, so, uh, sorry, can we get the mic uh, going? It, 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 can, can you turn that, that mic louder just so that everybody else can hear the question? Thank you. Uh, and I'll just repeat it. So the first question is, is this a replacement for VSTO? Um, and the answer is uh, no. We're de-emphasizing VSTO in the sense that we're no longer going to be investing our effort into it. However, it continues to work. Today we understand that the platform as it exists today is not enough to replace VSTO. We encourage you to build all of your apps that can be replaced uh, using this brand new model. And everything else you can use VSTO as a companion. So, yeah. Okay, um, and the second question is that um, you mentioned some restrictions around um, accessing Exchange Web Services. Mm -hmm. And um, my question is, how about accessing um, web services or databases and so forth, you know, kind of data exposing line of business data, which, is, and on top of that, um, you showed, uh, you listed some properties that's available, and attachments list seems to be not in there. Yeah. So how do you, like, is, is there a full story to take that message and copy it into SharePoint? Yeah, so that's a great management? question. Um, so to take the message and copy it into SharePoint, so uh, SharePoint APIs, we don't limit uh, within the app, your service would have to do that. And actually, unfortunately, that story is a bit complex in, in the version one of the platform. Uh, we see a lot of value in being able to integrate with SharePoint and uh, in building an app that is both within Exchange, within Outlook, and, within, and also talks to SharePoint. We see a lot of value, and this is a very important scenario for us. It's, we didn't get there with V1. It's, it's a little complicated to do that, but it is possible. And when you do that, you have to create two different apps. You have to create a SharePoint app, and you have to create an app for Outlook. And then the app for Outlook, uh, it can invoke EWS to grab all the properties, but then, you're, and then the, the, it has to pass it back to the service, and then the service has to call into SharePoint to save everything there. Now, to access attachments, it's a great question. We don't have attachment support in V, or we don't have great attachment support in V1. 
our story in v1 is that uh, you have to forward the using Exchange Web Services. You have to forward the entire mail item uh, to your to an SMTP address, and then there you can grab the attachment and, and save it off. Okay, and when is the version two coming out? Yeah, that's a great question. When is version two coming out? So, um, we know that two years is too long. Uh, we are trying to do two years. That said, we're trying to figure out. Uh, we understand that the web. Uh, works much faster and that it evolves a lot uh, much faster than our previous two year mod models have been. We don't know yet. We're trying to figure out how fast we can do this, but the goal is definitely to be able to roll something out on a much, much faster cadence. Um, the attachment access support and simplifying that is number one on our list, and, uh, and we're hoping to get that out like, much, much, much sooner than you, know, than you think. So. All right, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. I'm looking forward to version two. <laughs> this, okay. uh, uh, I had a question about the entities. Um, how are they? How localized are they? Uh, yeah. are, are you looking for? And is it possible to extend them? Yeah, that's a great question. So, uh, in terms of localization today, the entities. Some of the entities are only U.S. So the ones that aren't, are, for example, URLs. So URLs are there. It's a standard, right? Um, Phone number, uh, anything that has to do with text, uh, such as task suggestions, uh, postal addresses, all of that is US today. Um, we're actively working on gathering data. It's all about training our machine learning algorithm. So we're actively working on collecting more data so that we can uh, train it on more languages. But today, it's US only. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Yeah. Hi there. Um, is there any support um, in the client object model for this? In the in the what in model? The Outlook object model, um, the client side. Yeah. And is there a way to um, make changes to the actual <coughs> um, mail message? Yeah. So what specific? Um, specifically, what are you looking for? Are you looking for uh, like when well, you say, uh, is there any support in the client Outlook model? What do you, what do you mean by that? Well, I guess you know. Existing apps interacting with these apps, existing Outlook add-ins interacting with these apps, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Yeah, uh, we don't allow. In general, we aren't thinking that apps should be able to interact with each other. Your Outlook add-in could set a property that your app could then read, for example, if you really wanted to build it that way. So you could set an item property, and then you could read that item property from the from the, uh, the app for Outlook. Um, but but would so it depends on the scenario. So you could do something like that. Um, and uh, sorry, what was the second part to the question? Um, well, uh, kind of related to that whole area is, you know, is there a way to um, for the apps to interact with the actual Outlook item um, as opposed to going through web Exchange web services? Uh, I see. Um, so in Outlook, the app does interact with the Outlook item itself. The way the JavaScript API works is that, so I guess, to update an item, you have to use Exchange Web Services. Yeah. So you can all you can call update item with Exchange Web Services, and then you update it. So you can't update the item using like the Outlook model. Um, but if you, if the user is using Outlook not in cached mode, so it's an online mode, then anytime the user uses like a VSTO plugin, that item will be synced to Exchange, and then your the app can also can grab those properties, so they can they can interact that way. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if there are no more questions, thanks, guys. Thanks for your attention. Hope you guys built some great apps. Thank you.